Greetings fellow YouTubers, how you doing? Irv Lindsay here with the second episode of the Irv TV Queen City Podcast. I always drop this onto YouTube for you guys that might be interested in watching it. Um, if it does well, I'll continue to drop these onto YouTube. If they don't do well, I just won't do it. Um, just the way the metrics go, uh, it is a, a 20 to 30 minute video, at least right now, maybe longer eventually as if the podcast takes off. And what I don't want is everybody watching five minutes of this dropping out. Um, you know, that's what happened to the first one, but it was the first one. So I'll continue to drop these onto YouTube, um, at least for four or five episodes. We'll see where it goes from there. Um, so I have some changes to the schedule, but I'm going to talk about that. Here in a second, I'm going to start the actual podcast. Uh, all right, here we go. Greetings, everybody. How you doing? Irv Lindsay here. Welcome to the official Irv TV Queen City podcast. Um, so, I had originally said this podcast was going to be a weekly podcast. I have changed my mind about that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so here's here's the way it's gonna go. I'm gonna release a new podcast on the first and third Mondays of every month. Okay, that gives me plenty of time to read and research, so I can thoroughly present you guys with a well-researched podcast topic. Sometimes I might cover a couple of topics in a podcast, which is the case today. So happy Memorial Day to all you guys out there. Uh, the This podcast uh, is released on Monday, May 28th, 2018. And today we're going to talk about uh, this day in history, May 28th. Um, and on May 28th, 1977, one of the worst uh, nightclub tragedies in U.S. history happened at the Beverly Hills Nightclub. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we're also going to talk about. Uh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do comments. I'm gonna read some of the comments. I'm gonna do that periodically uh, on Irv TV. We'll go through some of my past videos, and I'll let you guys hear about some of the things people are saying and people are chatting about, both on Facebook and YouTube. Alrighty, so let's talk about the Beverly Hills Supper Club. Um, tomorrow, that is to say Tuesday, May 29th, 2018, I'm going to release a Supper Club video where I go out to the property. Evan and I got the chance on Saturday to go out to the property. Um, a bunch of TV stations were out there that day. A lot of the families of the victims were out there. Um, and um, other individuals associated with a lot of the buzz that is going on around the Beverly Hills Supper Club right now. So what is the basic story behind the Beverly Hills Supper Club? Well, um, I think most people understand the basic timeline and what happened there and all that, but a lot of my li a lot of my listeners and a lot of my viewers aren't Cincinnati natives, uh, and I just have to assume there's people out there that don't know. Okay, uh, so let's just a quick rundown of what the Beverly Hills Supper Club was. The Beverly Hills Supper Club was um, was founded way way back like a hundred years ago, and um, pardon me if my time frame on that is wrong. And it was originally called the Kane, the Kentucky Club or something like that. Um, an individual, this is, this is very interesting to me, um, an individual who had been associated with the Mafia uh, bought the property, the Hilltop property, and he was a former um, associate of George Remus, the king of the bootleggers. Uh, I got to do a podcast on George Remus one of these days. But anyway, George George Remus uh, was um, a really big one of the early early uh, prohibition bootleggers, and uh, he got taken down by the government. He was the one that started payoffs. He was the one that really started some of the traditions that we know of in the mafia that have become just standard operating procedure. And anyway, so one of his trusted lieutenants, 
uh, took his money after Prohibition, a lot of the money he had made off of Prohibition, because Prohibition single-handedly fueled the underworld. And I'm not sure the Mafia would be what they are and what they became if it weren't for Prohibition. Because these guys got filthy stinking rich off of alcohol. And it's a fact, more people drank alcohol during Prohibition than before or, or directly after it. Just, it just became the thing to do. Um, and so anyway, he took all the money he made, he invested it in some real estate in town, in Newport, and uh, back in those days, if the mafia liked your business and wanted it, they walked in and they said, you're going to sell it to me, and if you didn't, you know, you either ended up dead in an alley, or you disappeared, or they burned down your business, whatever. So this guy eventually sold his business to him, and he said, you know what, I'm going to get out of Newport, because Newport was the mafia capital of the Midwest back in those days. <laughs> Not really, guys, but there was a lot of mafia activity in Newport. Uh, and this was in the 1930s, and so this guy took all his money, and he went over and he bought what he called the Beverly Hills Club. And um, so that, that is, and that's the history of it. Now this guy eventually, after he opened up the Beverly Hills Club in the 1930s, the Mafia again said, hey, we love what you've done with the place. Guess what? It's for sale. Uh, long story short, he sold it to the Mafia, and the Mafia uh, ran the club until the 1960s, when a group of citizens got together and got rid of of all of the illegal gambling and gaming casinos in Newport because back then the Beverly Hills Club was all about gambling and um, of course gambling not legal uh, <clears throat> and <laughs> that didn't stop anybody but eventually they pushed the Mafia out or so they thought that's a whole other story guys if you want to look up the history of the Mafia in Newport and Northern Kentucky it is very interesting and it may not be what you think the Mafia did not leave Newport. A lot of people think the Mafia left Newport and all the corruption ended. That's not correct from what I'm reading, from what I'm being told. Uh, the, they were still there. They just changed modes and all the casinos closed. Uh, but anyway, so skip ahead and this property on top of the hill is vacant for many years until the late... Uh, the late 60s, early uh, around 1970, a guy by the name of Schilling who owned a um, a restaurant um, called called Schilling's. I believe it was a family-run business. It was he and his brother. I mean, I'm, I'm really pulling this out of my memory, and I <laughs> really shouldn't be. Um, they were in the restaurant business, and they bought it. And um, they really turned it into a premier show place. When you walked into the Beverly Hills Club, it was like walking into a Las Vegas showroom. You felt like you were in Hollywood. I mean, it was just like the big, big country clubs in California or, or, or New York, except it was right here in Northern Kentucky. It was absolutely gorgeous, very posh. They had all the big name stars at the Beverly Hills Supper Club, which is what he called it. It was no longer the Beverly Hills Club, it was the Beverly Hills Supper Club, because they didn't have ga gambling. They had shows, they had dinner, and um, all the big name A-list stars and singers and entertainers were there. I mean, seriously, you name it. P uh, the A-list 1970s entertainers, they were all there. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Phyllis Diller, every, they were all, every single one of them had been there. And so um, that's what this place was. You got dinner and a, um, you got dinner, which included dessert and a show for, um, you know, I, I just saw that ad the other day. It was very affordable, even for the, even if you adjust it for inflation. Let me pull that up here real quick. I have that. Uh, there it is right there. Let me. Let me put this, throw this up on the screen for you guys so you guys can see this as well. Here is the newspaper ad that was uh, for that fateful night. Uh, headliner John Davidson, who many of you may remember from uh, Hollywood Squares, and he did a lot of talk shows. He had his own, uh, he had his own talk show at one point. I, rem I, I remember this name and this face from my childhood. He was a real big face in the 80s on, on talk and uh, game show television. Um, 
So look, look, look at this price though. Thirteen ninety five for the John David the John Davidson show complete dinner and show package. Oh, by the way, you can only see this. I can only throw this up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> so for those of you in your car or elsewhere podcasting, um, I, I'll just kind of tell you what this has on there. This um, it is a. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. And uh, those are the dates he was going to be in town. Complete dinner and show package, appetizer through dessert, and show only. One medium drink, $13.95 for John Davidson. But also on the list is Phyllis Diller was supposed to have been there June 17th through the 26th. Rich Little was supposed to have been there June 28th through July 3rd. Uh, Buddy Rich, who is, I believe was a country singer, I could be wrong about that, July, was on July 5th. James Brown, wow, James Brown. <laughs> He's supposed to have been there on July 8th through the 17th, and Chuck Berry was supposed to have been there in August. So these are shows that never happened because uh, on, it looks like what, what, what would have been um, towards the end of, John Davis, according to this, now I don't know how long John Davis was, uh, John Davidson, uh, I'm sorry about that guys, I'm sorry Mr. Davidson, um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how, how long Mr. Davidson was there, but anyway, so $13.95, if you adjust that for inflation, it's somewhere around $140. Because uh, it's about we've we've the value of the dollar has increased by about a factor of ten since since then roughly roughly uh, there's all sorts of calculators online and I don't know why my nose keeps itching <laughs> okay so that night let's let's do a brief a brief rundown of of what happened that night um, I don't want to talk about the the why and I'll, I'll go into that in a moment stick around we'll talk about the who done it stuff that everybody loves to speculate about. All right, so roughly, I'm not going to go through this entire, literally, this entire timeline is a, is a whole page long. It's very detailed. So uh, at around 8 p.m., there is around 2,500 people inside the supper club. Now it was huge. It had dozens of rooms, and it was kind of a hodgepodge. If you look at a map of it, maybe I'll throw one up now if I remember. Um, you can see what it looked like. There's around Less than 3,000 people, by most estimates, were in that building that night. There is a small room called the Zebra Room. It was hot. It was so hot that the cake, there was a wedding party there, and the cake was melting and starting to uh, lean to one side. I've seen a picture of it. Uh, the wedding reception, the Zebra Room, breaks early because it's just way too hot in the room, and they leave. Uh, around 10 till 9 that night, um, a reservation clerk gets a whiff of smoke and she follows, she kind of does a little bit of detective work looking around from where that, where the smell is coming from. She ends up over at the zebra room. She opens the door. She sees a fire. She alerts a bartender who grabs a fire extinguisher and returns and uh, the waitress goes and calls the fire department and yells, we got to get people out of here. All right, so at 9 o'clock, one of the banquet captains begins to lead a couple hundred people from the crystal rooms from upstairs. The fire has started to spread up the spiral stairs, blocking off the main exit. So he leads the group through the kitchen to safety. At 9 p.m. in the cabaret room, and this is where the main casual, this is where the casualties happened, um, is in the big showroom in the back. Uh, there were two exits that day, and um, the exit that was locked was the upstairs exit in the crystal rooms, uh, which I have heard that if the crystal room had been on, the door had been unlocked, there was no way to get off, it exited onto the roof. Not only was there no way to get off the roof, but when the police, I mean, when the fire department showed up, I don't know if they had the equipment to get people off the roof. So that may have been tragic if that door had been unlocked. I don't know. Um, okay, so at 9 o'clock, one of the bus boys, Walter Bailey, jumps up onto the stage, grabs a microphone, and says there's a small fire, and asks everybody to exit. Of course, I believe the cabaret room was a first-come, first-serve seating, so people with the choice seats didn't want to get up and lose their place, right? 
Uh, also, a lot of people thought it was part of the act because of the way that the the two comedians on the stage handed him the microphone and the way he took it and handed it back to them. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a part of the act. Um, so after 9 o'clock is when the dispatch happened for Campbell County uh, where they logged the first call uh, for a fire at the Beverly Hills Supper Club. And from there, it's all downhill. Eventually, uh, most people get out of the building. Over 160 people did lose their lives that day because they didn't get out. And eventually, they pulled the fire department and rescue workers out of the building because um, the roof did not have sufficient support to remain up, and eventually the building did collapse. Um, there's a whole lot more to it than that, guys. If you want to research it and you want to hear more about the timeline, a really detailed play-by-play -play of what happened that day, um, go and there's a book. Um, you know, you'd think I'd have this book laying around so I could tell you the, the name of it. Um, I believe it's by Robert D. Webster. You know, I can do this real quick while I'm talking. Let me just uh, pull up Amazon. This book, it's called The Beverly Hills Supper Club, The Untold Story of Kentucky's Worst Tragedy. Robert Webster is the author. David Brock is also listed as um, one of the co-authors. There was a team of investigators spent five years researching this. Now, guys, the conclusion that they lead to, and I've got to say, they have an they have an enormous amount of evidence and research that is eyewitness testimonies and uh, lots of circumstantial evidence. I'm not going to go into that. I don't want to. But they name several high-level, uh, at least one high-level government official. There's a number of people that, that they point the finger at in their conclusion that it was a uh, mafia conspiracy that involved paid-off uh, state officials. Now, why, if they have such good evidence, which I've read the book and they have some great evidence, they've got pictures, they have eyewitness testimonies, they have um, the on this, the they have uh, a uh, uh, I'll call it an eyewitness testimony. One of the investigators, one of the fire investigators that was on the scene from the state that day. Um, talking about it being arson. <sighs> All right, so here's here's my deal. Why I don't want to talk about it, and why I think these guys have nailed it. You want to hear about it? You want to read about it? Go read the book. Um, nothing is ever going to come of this. Why? Because some of the people, if this is true, some of the people involved in this are still very powerful government officials are still alive and still have lots to lose. Um, so are these people guilty or are they innocent? Well, folks, if they're innocent, why should I talk about it? I'm just dragging somebody's good name through the mud. And if they're guilty, is it really the wisest thing to point my finger at somebody that has mafia connections? Uh, folks, go read the book. That's what I'll tell you. Um, is it true? Is it real? I don't know. There's a lot of buzz going on about this right now. I briefly met David Brock. He was out at the Supper Club site when Evan and I were hiking around uh, Saturday. And, um, yeah, so, I, it, it, you know, my heart goes out to people that had family. I have online, I've met a lot of you guys, and you had friends, and you had family that died that day. I've met people online that are survivors that were some of the last people to leave the building and um, moving forward from a tragedy is very difficult to do it's been 41 years today since the Beverly Hills Supper Club burned down and um, you know we will move forward and moving forward I you know I hate I hate the phrase I hate the phrase move on I hate that Move on means you're just going to forget about it and you're going to move on. You're going to put it behind you and you're going to move. No. 
Moving forward means that you're not forgetting. You're not just... Some things you just can't forget. Some things you can't leave behind. But you're going to move forward. And you're going to make progress. Because that's what you've got to do. So, uh, anyway, guys, that's my two cents worth for the Beverly Hills Supper Club. Before I move on, next we are going to do, uh, I'm going to read you some comments from videos uh, on my channel that have, you know, over the last uh, month or so. Before I do that, guys, if you are on, if you're not on YouTube and you're listening to this on Anchor.fm or one of the other locations that my podcast is, is distributed to, you can also watch my Cincinnati history videos. I explore Cincinnati history on youtube.com slash TV. You can go there. You can get all the latest videos. I've been doing this for more than two years now, and I've got tons of videos where I go all over the Cincinnati area exploring places and things and talking about important people and talking about the past and once was what once was. So check it out, youtube.com slash TV. All right, now I want to talk about some comments that have happened, and I'm going to start over on uh, over on Facebook because I do distribute lots of my stuff to Facebook. <coughs> and um, so if we go to the Irv TV page, and let's look at some of the comments that people have been making on stuff. Uh, one of these surprises that had really shocked me uh, over the last um, over the last month, yeah, I, you know when I when I publish a video, I never know how well it's going to do. Um, so, the road trip, the last video on the road trip Friday series just ended, um, and unfortunately, it ended on Memorial Day weekend, which isn't a good weekend. It's not a good not a good time to be posting videos. I'm hoping you guys will hop over there and watch my Young's Jersey Dairy video where we went to Yellow Springs um, a little while back. Um, it's, it was definitely a fun video I enjoyed doing and I enjoyed being in Yellow Springs. Um, so uh, there wasn't a lot of comments on that. Uh, let's hop over to YouTube. I had a lot of comments on YouTube um, over the last week. Um, so, I had a comment on an old video where I did my uh, tour of Historic Price Hill, um, where somebody said uh, their parents were married in that, that old church over there in, in, in Price Hill. It's, uh, I believe it's off of near Glenway in Warsaw. I think it's on Warsaw. Um, that's a really beautiful church, guys. One of these days, I'm going to have to go inside some of these churches and, and, and just do some filming. Um, now, the surprise video from this from this last month was the old buildings on Spring Grove Avenue video. I never know what you guys are and aren't going to watch. Um, but in that video, I had somebody that used to live here uh, that talks about growing up on Spring Grove Avenue near the Western Hills Viaduct. Um, he doesn't use his real name, um, but he lives in California. And, uh, he does now. He says he spent many hot summer evenings as a kid watching traffic getting tied up on Scream Spring Grove as people went to Crosley Field to watch the ball games. Man, I can imagine because uh, that wasn't as wide then, then as it is now. And I can imagine everybody getting just all tied up there trying to get to get to the ball game on time. Um, yeah. A lot of comments about the freight yard that I show in the video. The freight yard that I show in the video, it was a freight yard. It's now owned and, and has private businesses in it. Um, but the freight, you know, not, it was, our, our, the train companies are private businesses too, but you guys know what I mean. Non-railroad businesses. Um, a lot of people enjoyed seeing that. I thought I might do a video there a while back. I never did. Um... All right, so Noah's, one of the buildings in that video, that refers to Noah's Ark, according to Steve. Uh, thanks for commenting, Steve. He says, that used to be called Noah's Ark. It was a restaurant and bar and rooming house for railroad workers. He said it got its name, Noah's Ark, during the 1937 flood when it was one of the few buildings to survive the massive, massive fires caused by the flood. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, let's see, what else? 
Awkward Bob. Um, he thought that the the old anchor building would make a great restaurant if there's space inside. That the building, if you watch the the video, it's a it's the building that had is in, in the curve. Very unique building. I really liked it. I liked the curve. That was interesting to see an old building that was not just a square box. Uh, what else? I have requests to do more East Side videos. Uh. You know, I live on the west side and one of the reasons why I started doing videos was because I wanted to get to know Cincinnati a little better. I need, I wanted to get to get to know uh, and learn the history and so I, I start where I'm at and I branch out. I do need to do more east side videos. I do have at least a couple of ideas for stuff I can do on the east side. So I will be returning to the east side eventually. Uh, I had somebody ask if I do tours. I've never actually done a tour, but if anybody would be interested in me doing a tour, uh, I would be open to that. I probably would charge about the same as the, the guys do the Over the Rhine tours, or I probably would undercut them <laughs> uh, because I'm new and they're not. They're established, so it would be something along whatever whatever they charge, something similar but but less. Uh, and I you know do do a, um, I could do a small group. If anybody was interested in that, I would be open to it. Message me facebookcom slash Lindsay, E R V L E N Z Y. You can uh, message me there. And uh, if anybody out there is interested in it. Uh, all right, what else we got going on? Scrolling down a little more. Um, so my uh, Road Trip Friday video from last week, or now it would be the week before, uh, where I did the, um, the, the, I was in Louisville and I was showing the crumbling old building there. That was an older video, guys. Uh, those of you who are from Louisville can tell that it's an older video. Um, that, um, I would like to know if those little buildings behind it are, have been torn down yet. Because they were clearing them out and they were marked for demolition and that video was taken in 2016. So I, I am interested to know if they've been knocked down yet. Uh, my friend Matt says he's going to check when he's down there, but if anybody lives that way and you watch my videos, let me know. I'm, I'm very interested to know what that looks like today because I haven't been down to Louisville in a while. Uh, and, of course, the uh, vintage tour of Union Terminal, what we now know as the Cincinnati Museum Center. Um, I... I had a comment um, that it definitely look definitely looks airport esque, and yes, I agree. It's very airport esque, uh, and it's obvious that when they started designing airports, the airport design terminal designs were really inspired by a lot of the train station designs. Unfortunately, Union Terminal was a little late on the uh, Cincinnati was a little late on building a, a, a terminal. By the time we finally built a railroad terminal, a uh, railroad was on the way out. Uh, cars were on the way in and government decided, made the decision that they were going to go with private transportation in the United States as our primary mode of, of transport here, uh, whereas other countries went with more public means. That has had good and bad things about it. Um, that is a subject for another video. All right, guys, I appreciate you watching. If you're on YouTube, appreciate you listening. If you're in other places, uh, remember this will be a bi-monthly bo uh, podcast. It means it'll be on the first and the third Wednesdays of every month. No, first and the third Monday. Monday, folks. <laughs> first and the third Monday of every month. Everybody, I appreciate you being here and taking this brief journey with me. Everybody, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep fighting a good fight. Hey, I'll see you in the next video or podcast.